Yeah, thank you, uh, Sandrine, for the, the kind introduction. And um, yeah, uh, I first, I want to uh, also talk, uh, spend a minute talking about L. I, I uh, knew of L through Donald um, when I was at Osram, I believe it's around 2003. So Donald, um, you probably remember, you visited uh, San Jose, uh, California in 2003. And then subsequently, I hire a former student uh, of L. Uh, his name is uh, Dmitry Porowski um, to Osram. And we actually learned a great deal from the, uh, the carry transport measurement uh, technique that developed by L. Um, uh, we, were basic, we were back then working on polyfluorine, trying to understand the degradation mechanism in those uh, polymer LEDs. And uh, so we learned to um, use um, um, time of flight as well as uh, emittance spectroscopy to analyze the, the carrier transport um, of those materials. And then uh, since then, I, you know, since I started my acad academic career at University of Florida in 2005, I visited uh, uh, Imperial uh, several times. I remember the last time I visited, I believe it was like 2016, where we were having beer and watching, I believe it was a European Cup soccer in a big lecture theater, and we did have a very good time. And so um, definitely L is, um, is, is missed uh, uh, by many of us. And uh, it is really a great opportunity um, and my honor to, to be uh, speaking at this uh, symposium. So with that, I, I want to turn to my slide. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, manipulation of light emission in thin film LEDs. And um, so, okay, so um, I've been working on um, OLED light extraction primarily for, um, uh, for uh, solid state lighting uh, for more than 10 years now. So this is uh, one of the earliest work that we, we published that uh, we're using, uh, making um, OLED on top of a corrugated uh, uh, structure. And, and with that, uh, we know we have uh, some uh, uh, diffraction of light uh, from, the, uh, from the OLED. As a result, we see enhancement in the light output. For example, you see here, the efficiency goes from you know, 60 candela per m to 80 candela per m. Back then, we don't really fully understand exactly what's going on, uh, what's, you know, what's the uh, detailed optics um, in the device. Since then, we developed, you know, uh, we went in the more uh, uh, in-depth studies and developed a, a technique that allow us to, um, to understand the, um, the optics of the system. And so since then, we were now more focusing you know, in the last 10 years, uh, we, we're shifting to uh, more uh, on the optics and photonic side of the of, uh, light emitting uh, devices. So first, um, let me talk about the optical modes in, um, in OLED. And you can um, um, regard uh, OLED is basically is a, um, a symmetric waveguide where it is fabricated on a, um, a glass substrate with um, um, with a stack of organic and ITO layer, which has a high index refraction about, you know, uh, 1.7 to 1.8. And then, the, so because of the, the thin film presence, you have a uh, waveguide mode, you have both TE, uh, TM waveguide mode, as well as the surface uh, plasma polarometer mode. And uh, typically with the, the structure, we have about 25% of the light uh, extracted, and then the rest of the light is being trapped either in the substrate at, or in you know, different uh, optical modes presence. So to understand the um, different optical modes, um, you have to um, look at this uh, from the point of view of the in-plane wave vector. The wave vector is given by 2n, 2 pi n over lambda. And um, so, so you can divide that into four different regions. So um, when uh, the in-plane wave vector is smaller than the index of air, then the, the light will be extracted. So there's this air mode. And then when it's the, the imprint wave vectors uh, is smaller than the, um, the, the, the glass index, then it is um, trapped in the waveguide. And then when it's, uh, 
uh, when the index is lower than the index of uh, um, organic layer, then this is um, you light is trapped in uh, uh, waveguide mode, and then the rest of them is um, in the SPP mode, which is evanescence um, mode. And um, on the right, you see uh, the mode dispersion curve. We are plotting the photon energy as a function of the in-plane wave factor. You can see this is the air mode. Um, you have the, um, the substrate mode, and then the rest of these, uh, the TM, TE, and SPP mode. And, and so understand it uh, um, further, you can um, use a, a 3D uh, plot. Uh, so the vertical axis is the uh, photon energy and then the, uh, the X, Y axis are the corresponding, um, the uh, in-plane wave factor in the X and Y direction. And then um, if, um, so the, since air has the uh, lowest index, so we can uh, represent it as a cone. So we call it air cone. And then the, uh, the organic layer has a, a slightly larger index, so, um, so represented by the blue uh, cone here, we call it waveguide cone, and then we have the SPP cone um, um, on the outer uh, side. And then um, when you take a vertical uh, dissection and you get um, the, the dispersion, um, and then when you actually take a, uh, the region corresponding to the uh, emitted light, then this is what you see. Um, this is the um, in the middle is the air mode, and this is the subframe mode, and then you have the, uh, the waveguide mode as well as the SPP mode. So how do you characterize this um, uh, different optical modes? Uh, we developed a technique we call the um, angle resolved uh, electroluminescence spec uh, uh, spectra uh, measurement. So basically, um, this is a setup now. Uh, we've been doing that for the last five years. And this is a setup now, it actually is being commercialized by um, Fluxum. Um, they sell this setup. Uh, I have nothing to do with that, but they uh, listened to my presentation and they, they actually commercialized the technique that uh, they, we developed. So what it is, is basically is an um, optical dynamometer. So we have a, a, a device mounted on a um, rotary uh, stage, which allow us to turn the, um, um, the device uh, by uh, one degree. So, uh, so you need to have a, a very high precision um, stepping motor to do that. And then uh, we also allow us to um, uh, rotate the sample um, along the, uh, uh, the sample plane. And, uh, and so we can look at the different angles effect and then you can add the polarizer so you can study the, um, the emission um, in the S polarized or, or P polarized uh, 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 light. And then you can measure the spectrum using, you know, coupling the light with the optical fiber to a spectrometer. And this is typically what we measure. Um, you measure the, uh, the emissions uh, spectrum as a function of um, angle. And from this, you can um, convert that from the angle, you can um, convert that into the imprinting wave factor. And this is what um, experimentally, uh, what we can measure. And so what can we do with this? Now, if you, um, like what I described in the first slide where uh, when you make a, a device on a corrugated substrate, um, then um, you get a diffraction at different interfaces. Uh, for example, the, uh, the waveguide mode is um, mainly concentrated in the ITO uh, uh, layer and it will be diffracted uh, from the ITO glass interface. And then from the, um, the, uh, the SPP mode primary located at the metal interface and it will be diffracted by the the corrugated metal interface. So with the, um, with the presence of this grading uh, with a periodicity of kepler lambda, then it would uh, reduce the actual uh, uh, in-plane wave factor by the magnitude of uh, case of G, where the uh, case of G is the, um, uh, the in-plane wave factor corresponding to um, the, the grading. So with that, um, so these modes are in a planar device, um, you, will not, you will not be able to see, um, but then when you have it on the grading, then you can bring this, um, reduce the in-plane wave factor such that now these modes can be extracted, All right? So you can, um, knowing the, um, um, the in-plane wave vector of uh, different modes, you can identify um, the, the nature of the, uh, the extracted mode. So this is the very first experiment that we did. So this is a planar device. You, you see, this is a Lambertian meter. Um, we don't, basically it's featureless. 
But then when you have the device fabricated on the um, um, uh, corrugated uh, substrate, then you see different blobs here uh, corresponding to uh, the different optical modes, which I will tell you what they are later. So if again, if you look at, remember the, the, the different cones that I showed you previously. So this is the air that uh, if you look at the top, um, so this is the, the air cone um, represented by the, by the, um, uh, the black dash line. And then the SPP mode is rep represented by the, uh, the red circle. Since now light is, if you have a um, device that's made on a, um, a hexagonal um, a grating structure, and light will be diffracted uh, along six different directions, as you see from this. Um, so because of uh, they're displaced in different uh, six different directions, then um, light now will be um, extracted, and you will see these features. And so this is experiment experimentally what we measure. So you see these uh, red line; these are corresponding to the uh, uh, the diffracted light. So uh, with this analysis, you can now identify um, these are the, uh, the waveguide mode and these uh, blobs are, are the, uh, the SPP mode. And um, so you can do further analysis by normalizing, um, taking the experimental data and divided by the emitting uh, spectrum. Then you can, um, this is the normalized uh, dispersion. So now this is fully corresponding to the, uh, the, the band structure of the corresponding uh, photonic crystal, right? So you can identify, for example, this is the TM waveguide mode. This is the TE mode, which is very weak. And I'll um, explain to you why we have such a weak diffraction from TE waveguide mode. And then um, the strongest is coming from the SPP mode, okay? So this is, um, we've done the um, experiment um, analyzing the, um, the S uh, polarized light and P polarized light. And so these are the, um, the features that we can measure and they are in very good agreement with uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, the, the device simulation results show that um, you have SBP mode, the waveguide mode, I mean, T waveguide mode and TM waveguide mode. And so with this, we're able to um, look at the effect of light extraction Right, so this is a, um, the black curve showing the spectrum of the, um, the planar device and the blue, uh, the blue uh, data are the one that corresponding to the device are coming from a corrugated. Um, so you do see um, uh, enhanced light extraction, ex extraction around 140 nanometer, um, 680 nanometers, uh, 580 nanometer and 650 nanometer. And you can look at the enhancement factor um, so we, we have uh, the strongest enhancement, or more than two times enhancement uh, coming from the SP NEMO, uh, uh, but weaker diffraction coming from the TE uh, waveguide mode. So the question is um, why we see that? Um, well, why we see that is because um, we have very strong diffraction coming from the, um, the metal organic interface. On the other hand, for the, uh, for the uh, TE waveguide mode extraction, you need to have sufficient um, index contrast to, to diffract the light. If the index contrast is not large enough, then we don't see a, um, um, we, we see a weaker diffraction effect. And so, in fact, we can play with the, uh, the corrugation uh, geometry, and you can see that by going from, you know, planar device to 55 nanometer corrugation depth to 60, I mean, to, eight, to 80 nanometer uh, corrugation that we see very strong, uh, the diffraction is getting stronger. And um, as I told you that um, the diffraction is very um, also dependent on the, um, the index contrast. So when we introduce a low index uh, buffer layer, um, you see the T waveguide mode now is a lot more enhanced compared to the, um, the device that without the, um, the low index layer. Now, the reason why we see also a decrease in the uh, SPB mode because the device is partially planarized. Um, so instead of getting a very uh, highly corrugated um, uh, metal interface, the, the interface has become planar. As a result, we see less diffraction of the SPP mode. So as a result, after all the optimization, now we're able to get um, a, a device that with a, a extraction efficiency of 72% um, by optimizing the structure. 
And so this is uh, also more recent work that we've done on uh, 1D uh, grading, and you can see analyzing the uh, the the, um, the photonic uh, band structure. We can you know uh, see different modes, and then we even see the uh, we 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 do see a photonic band presence in the device. Now, I'm not going to get detail of that, but I um, uh, recently this is something that we we start use uh, working on perovskite laser. We use this tool actually to help us to design um, the uh, uh, the laser cavity. And so next, I'm going to talk about the micro cavity effect. So micro cavity effect is present in the OLED because the fact that the, the device is um, made, um, if you, particularly this is even stronger when you have a device made on a bottom emitting device where the bottom is a uh, reflector, metal um, electrode, and the top is a thin metal layer. And so since you have uh, uh, both interfaces uh, highly uh, reflective, you form a strong cavity. And as a result of the cavity effect, um, you see a, a spectral shift um, of the, uh, so this is again using the ARES uh, technique that we can, we can uh, see the, uh, you know, as you increase the, um, going from normal direction, to um, off angle, you see a blue shift in the um, in, in the spectrum, and this is you know typically what we see, and and so this is a really not a desirable effect because going from zero degree to sixty degrees, you see the um, the um, emission um, uh, peak going from two point one um, um, electron volt to uh, two point four electron volt, so. Um, so with this, um, we decided to play with the optics. So we make the device actually on uh, with a spacer, with a thick spacer. Now we actually have a very large um, uh, a dielectric stack. So now we're creating a device with not a single mold because in a typical OLED, the, the, the organic stack is very thin. So there's only one mold um, is supported. But when you increase the thickness to you know up to seven uh, micron, then you get many moles. And, and so this is what we actually see. Um, this is single mode, going from single mode to, uh, uh, to a, um, a multi-mode device, you see many peaks and valleys. So these are each peaks and valleys, a uh, 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 peak and valley correspond to one optical mode, you just can count how many moles. So here you have about 16 and 16, uh, uh, 15, 16 mole presence. And so this is the, um, again, the ARES measurements. And so with this, now we are able to significantly reduce any color shift. You can see that the angle, um, you know, uh, there's very little change in the CIE coordinate as you change the angle. So next, I'm going to uh, tell you something that uh, more recently that we've done using uh, photonic structure to do uh, light manipulation in terms of light uh, uh, beam shaping and steering and also controlling of the, uh, the polarization. So, this has some um, important application because it can be used for uh, projected display, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, VR, AR type of uh, display as well as for, for laser application. Um, so let me skip this. So how do we achieve um, um, uh, directional um, emission? So if you remember what I showed, so this is a typical OLED, conventional OLED, where we make um, we, uh, the devices made on top of a uh, uh, ITO uh, substrate, and then we have ETL, EML, HTL presence. And in a typical OLED design, you want to maximize the, uh, the cavity emission, right? Um, so to get the, the highest EQE. But then um, what we decided to do is to, um, to suppress the cavity emission, but we only want to enhance the, um, uh, the TE waveguide mode. Now, why do we want to do that? Because the TE waveguide mode, if you remember previously, that the has a very narrow uh, um, width in terms of the, uh, the in-plane wave vector uh, scale, so which, which is corresponding to the, um, the emission angle. So it has a very, so if you're able to extract the, the TE waveguide mode, you're gonna get a very narrow, well-defined emission angle. Okay, so to do that, we need to suppress the, uh, the cavity mode. Um, we want to um, couple the, only the T waveguide mode, but not other mode. Now, how do we do that? 
So let me explain this um, one more time using this uh, figure. So now we make an OLED. So just uh, ignore the um, uh, the rest of the photonic structure. So we just look at ITO and the corrugated substrate uh, with a grating. Okay, with a periodicity of uh, capital lambda. Okay, so this is T wave dimo. So how do we extract T wave dimo? So we need to have a periodicity of the grating um, that would um, uh, such that it would bring the um, the light from um, to, into ammo. Now on the right we show the um, the the mole profile, right? So this is the the red region correspond to the ammo. This is the boundary between ammo and substrate mole, and the blue line correspond to the T wave dimo, right? So if you so T wave dimo is as polarized. So if we have the grading introduced, you um, now you uh, with the, uh, uh, the presence of case of G, then the the, um, the AMO, I mean the S, the T wave dimo uh, can be extracted. And so, how do you suppress AMO? Well, you suppress AMO. Um, this is known um, that uh, because of the cavity effect, um, the the um, the AMO is a strong function of the uh, the ETL thickness, which is the distance between um, the emitting layer to the to the cathode, right? So typically in a conventional OLED, um, we design the device structure such that um, uh, at the anti node position where the uh, AMO emission is maximum. But as I said, I want to um, get a minimum output from, from AMO. Um, so that corresponds to a, a ETL thickness of about 140 nanometer. In fact, this is the region where the, um, the the wave guide mode is maximized. And this is what we want. So, um, so this is, again, this is the, um, um, the typical OLED. Um, now, when we have a, um, uh, when we have the device um, at the uh, node condition, then you get very little uh, light extracted and all the light is being trapped inside the, um, inside the OLED. Okay, so now we make uh, how, uh, if what happened when we make a device on the corrugated substrate. Um, so when we make it on the corrugated substrate and you see this is the cross-section uh, cross SEM, uh, this is the, um, the profile of the substrate and this is the ITO and you can see the, the corrugation profile um, is being, uh, uh, is actually, um, uh, you see the corrugation profile up to the aluminum, this is the cathode um, layer. Right, so that means in 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 this particular case, all the moles will be uh, extracted: the T wave guide mole, the TM wave guide mole, as well as the SPP mole. On the other hand, when we make the device in the uh, no condition, because now we are increasing the um, organic layer thickness, then the um, the SPP mole, because of the planarity at the aluminum interface, the SPP mole and the TM wave guide mole would not be diffracted. Okay, and and as a result, we only see emission from the wave dimo. Okay, and again, we're showing this. Um, this is the um, the, the mole profile. This is the uh, S um, the TM uh, T wave dimo and the TM wave dimo and the SPP mole. Okay, so with the um, with the uh, the grading, now we're able to um, extract the T T wave dimo, but not other mole presence in the device. And so what's the result? So this is the ARES uh, measurements um, with the device that uh, under uh, anti node condition. And um, you see, we uh, in a planar device, um, we see um, light um, emission. Um, this is um, a typical Lambertian uh, profile. So when we uh, make this device, on um, on the corrugated substrate, you see this is we get very little uh, TE wave guide mode um, extracted, as we uh, I, I show you previously, and then you get very strong diffraction from the SPP as well as the TM wave uh, TM wave guide mode because we um, it is diffracted by the uh, aluminum interface, and this is also shown in the in the um, the mode profile. On the other hand, when we make um, on a thick ETL layer. Um, on the planar device, we absolutely get very, very little, right? I mean, you see, hardly see any light emission, both the TE and TM uh, or S and P polarized light. 
But then if you look at the, um, um, the, the corrugated device, you see very nice two streaks of T waveguide mode and nothing from the TMO. And this is again shown in the, in the, in the, in the profile. So with such a device, we get the full width has maximum um, about uh, four degrees. And um, we achieve very highly polarized light emission uh, with TE to TM ratio uh, is 13. And so this is, you know, in terms of efficiency, of course, these are not very high efficiency devices uh, because we're just extracting the, the TE wave time mode. And um, so going from a, I mean, this is a normal uh, device, the blue is the planar device. And then uh, on the corrugated device, the efficiency is very, uh, uh, very uh, about the same. Then when we um, make the, um, um, the waveguide emission uh, device, and you can see that um, now, or the, or the, um, the planar device with a thick uh, ETL, we get um, one or 2% efficiency. But then when we uh, make it on the corrugated device, we actually the efficiency goes up to about 7%. And you can see also the narrowing of the emission spectrum. Um, so um, the yellow curve correspond to um, the, um, uh, the waveguide emission, okay? Um, so you get a significantly narrowing. And then also we are able to get uh, up to a 13, um, a ratio of 13 of the, the T to TM uh, polarization ratio. So going from this to, um, uh, so we said, well, let's try another device with a very narrow emission spectrum. So that would be, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the heavy metal European complexes are known to give very narrow line emission. And so this is actually the, uh, the device that we fabricated. And uh, compared to our uh, typical phosphorescent spectrum, which has a full effect maximum of 60 nanometer. And now with the uh, European complex, we can narrow it down to about four nanometers. And so this is the resulting device. You can see very nice, clear uh, diffraction uh, from you know, the reference device. This is a one degrading, and this is a two degrading that um, we see. And the divergence of such a device is uh, um, only three degrees. And, and now after we've done this, we look at the effect of, uh, of the index refraction. Right, so if you look at the mole, po uh, mole uh, profile of mole uh, distribution, so here we're showing different, you know, subframe mode, um, the uh, T waveguide mode, SPP mode, uh, TM waveguide mode, and AMO. And as a function of the, um, the uh, uh, refractive index, so as you increase the index refraction, um, you increase the amount of uh, the T waveguide mode, and as a result, you get more, since you get more TE waveguide mode presence, then you get, you get more light out. So we tried that, well, one of the uh, easy thing to try is uh, to use a uh, perovskite. So with perovskite, then we are actually able to, so this is a reference device, planar device um, with the, uh, the waveguide emission. This is the, um, you can see with the perovskite, we have uh, actually two modes. We have TE0 and um, uh, TE1 mode, and then with the, a full width has max, maximum of uh, uh, 12 nanometer and the emission divergence is uh, three degrees. So for the ARES spectrum, you can see um, the, uh, the T waveguide mode, um, you can see the presence of uh, two modes. This is the T0 and this is TM1 and uh, a T1 and then we get a very little emission from the TM mode. Um, so in terms of efficiency, the, the EQE is not very high because the, uh, the PLQY of the particular uh, perovskite layer that, uh, material that we use is not very high. Um, but then if you look at the current efficiency, because this is a directional uh, emission uh, LED, we actually get the, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the current efficiency up to 60, can, almost uh, to 60 candela per amps. So by, by um, having a, a uh, high PLQY perovskite, um, so this deficiency can go up to, you know, over well, uh, well over 100 uh, candela per amp. So, um, so this is actually also the um, extension ratio um, of the T to TM wave, uh, waveguide ratio is up, up to uh, 14 to 16. So um, to summarize, um, so we're able to uh, develop a, a highly uh, directional and polarized uh, waveguide emission OLED uh, on a corrugated substrate. And we're able to get a, a small angle of divergence um, 
down to three degrees and uh, the, um, um, the TE to wave uh, TM extinction ratio of uh, 13. Um, and then with the uh, perovskite um, emitter, we're able to get um, uh, uh, very high, uh, high uh, uh, up to uh, 56 candle per m. And uh, we anticipate uh, much higher efficiency can be achieved um, if we use a uh, high uh, efficiency uh, perovskite uh, emitting material. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Frankie, for a, a wonderful um, start to this, this session, a great talk. Um, we have time um, for a few questions. Thanks for being on time as well. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Dono, great. Thank you. Thanks, Frankie. Um, so I guess in terms of the uh, TE uh, waveguide mode emission, you showed that the two um, uh, angular emission lobes. Does that then produce an annulus when you look uh, sort of face on? And if you have an annulus, do you then need to put a, a scattering layer just if you want to use it for a, a device so that it doesn't have that angular variation? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, if, if that's the case, yeah. But our, um, the, the uh, objective is just trying to um, make a device that with a strongly angular emission. 